Okay, so I wanted to read this thing, um, which is a transcription of um, a recording I made of a guy on the subway, and I do that a lot. Maybe some people think it's a bit unethical, but there's just so much material, and I have all these um, recordings of all types of wild stuff happening on the train, and I title them things like Library Bathroom Banter, uh, it's from the library, Numerology of the Antichrist, Junkies Make Me Want to Dance, um, there's just there's so many wackos just, you know, ranting, and it's delightful. Um, so, um, uh, this says there's something wrong with my video. I'm just going to go for this, and hopefully people can see and hear me. But uh, anyway, I'm just going to read this um, as well as I can remember the guy spoke it on the train. So this is some uh, former Marine on the um, Uptown 2-3 uh, a few months ago who was talking, I thought, to himself, but it turns out he was talking to a woman across from him who was just sort of politely nodding and not really responding because he was just monologuing. And then when she left, he switched to me because I sat down across from him and I was recording. Um, so here we go. <clears throat> no, because I live on 126th and Lex, zombie land. Shit gets hectic up there. I bought my wife some mace and uh, and a stun gun because it's better to be safe than sorry, you know. And I know from experience you could use a, you lose your life out here or else get badly hurt or robbed and then your sense of security is all screwed up for so long. So I told her, carry this and even if you don't feel better, I'll feel better. I mean, things can change on a dime and your entire world can change completely. I remember on 9-11, I was going to do a job interview. I was right downtown. I saw the first plane hit. Everyone was standing around, shocked and scared and whatever. But it wasn't until the second plane hit that, you know, we all knew. We knew it was bigger than just an accident. That this was the biggest thing to happen in 50 years. So I ended up walking over the Brooklyn Bridge, hundreds of people scrambling, scared. I still remember seeing a woman falling from the 80th floor of Tower 1. She had on a red skirt and stockings. I could see it clearly. And I'll never forget that, man. <clears throat> and I didn't make the interview, needless to say. And a woman and her daughter walked with me. And, and, I, and I don't know if you were here then, but, but for the next month, total strangers were coming up to each other and just hugging or asking if you're okay. It was amazing. But this woman and her daughter were standing on the corner, and the woman was crying, and the daughter didn't understand. She was really little, maybe three or four. And I could see that the mother was in shock, so I went up to her, and I said, Come on, Mom. And I just grabbed the mom's hand. Within half a block, her hand went from my hand to around my face. And she put her whole body leaned into me. And I had her daughter in one arm and my arm around her. I mean, like, you would have thought this was my family. I didn't know them from anywhere. And we didn't speak. We spoke when we got to the other side of the bridge. She started asking me impossible questions. Are we at war? Is this it? What's happening? Are we getting more attacked? You know, this and that. And I was like, no disrespect, sweetheart, but I know what you know. Now, we've been attacked. So far, there's been some radical shit. I'm sure this is going to lead to war. They just attacked our two extremist buildings. And, you know, she offered to pay for my cab. You know, I offered to pay for hers. I'm like, no, I have plenty of money. But she was like, no, it's the least I could do. And, you know, her daughter was writing me for years. Like, when I was in the Marine Corps and everything, she would send me letters and drawings and it was just always sweet, you know? But there's reasons, I guess, and purposes for everything in life, you know? But I've never been the same person, and it's felt like these last few years I've just lost, <laughs> you know? But uh, God is good. Never give up, you know? Uh, take care of yourself, sweetheart. Remember what I said about the mace? These days, you got to protect yourself on shit. Train? It's insane. Every day somebody's getting attacked. The other day I was telling her some young kid attacked me, you know, for no fucking reason. I, 
I was talking to MTA worker, it was late at night, but my hand was swollen like this. But he heard that I was Marine, you know, I was in the Marine Corps for 10 years. I also got two black belts, you know what I mean? Like, if I didn't have the hand bandaged, I was going to hurt this kid badly. And he was a, like, 20-year-old kid, 6'1", who had a good-looking, you know, well-taken-care-of a $70, $80 haircut, you know, because I'm a barber now. It was dyed blonde and cut really nicely. Like, he was well-taken-care-of. But he still, like, attacked me and spit at me. And I was like, what is your issue? I mean, like, you're a man. What's the matter? What's wrong with you? Because I know I have a son older than you, and I look at him, and you could do anything. You could be anything. Why are you choosing this? I was like, these second decisions could change your life, whole outcome of your life. It could make you a felon, or it could get you very hurt badly. Because I was going to hurt him badly. Normally, if my hand wasn't hurt, as soon as the spit was in the air, so would have I. And even after that, I was thinking, you know, balls, chest, jaw, you know, kicks, broken jaw. And then when he was out on the floor, I was going to break his arm, shoulder, and his leg. Like, he was going to remember this forever. And he was going to tell his family he was a victim. And now, it might have changed that young man or it might have made him worse. And you know, I'm not God, I'm not playing the decision, it just, that moment, I decided not to fight with him, you know? But I, he was like, what do you want? I said, what it is you don't want to do is get back in this train with me. And he, he agreed and just walked away. But what provoked that? If he did that to me, what would he do to a woman or to anybody, you know? And it's like, what is this new style that to attack other people on the fucking train, you know? And you can't count on nobody in New York to help you. People do not help you here, you know? I'm always the dumbass to help people, and my wife is always telling me why, you know? And I'm just like, because it's the right thing to do. Now, I was in the Marine Corps for 10 years. I only left because I caught traumatic brain injury. I got two Purple Hearts, special operatives, and, you know... Battalion recon, special operations. My first time there, I was there 15 months. My area of operation was the Triangle of Death. One time we had combat for three months straight. You know, like I never thought I'd leave. And then I get home and my dog won't go near me. You know, she sensed something other people didn't sense. Maybe war or, but something, you know. You know, and uh, I was in an explosion that kind of failed. And, and it still broke three bones in my foot, my ankle, my knee, both collars, dislocated my shoulder. So I was in a bed in Walter Reed Medical Center, leg up and uh, one of these contraptions where I couldn't feed myself, clean myself for four months. You know, that was like the most embarrassing time in my life. And years later, I got traumatic brain injury. It gives me seizures and memory loss, you know. And that changed my life. Because that summer, 2010 summer, I was coming to be in the police academy. You know, I was figuring I want to do life in both and get two pensions, you know. I was already a homeowner, so, you know. I had the kids, the family. So I wanted everything. And, you know, for some reason, it, it didn't work out. But if I didn't have my helmet off on that night, it would have took my head off. And that's the shit. In, in special operatives, we have the option not to wear our helmet. We have to have some type of cover. And that, I, that night, I was like, let me put my helmet on. Leave it like this. It was a last-minute decision, but it was the decision that saved my life. And they had to cut the shit off my head because there was a piece of metal sticking out. You know, like an explosion near me peppered me, you know, with pieces of fragment you know just one piece like caused a traumatic brain injury and it didn't penetrate a lot maybe that much but it's all it needed it's touching your skull and you they used laser technology to make the hair the blood evaporate but 
They induced a coma. They drilled three holes in my head to reduce the swelling. I was in Germany for a month. I don't remember that shit, you know? I don't remember, like, the helicopter ride. I don't remember how I got to Washington, D.C. I don't remember none of that shit, you know? And then I left there, and I'm a walking pharmacy. I had Percocets, Oxycontins, Clonopins, Phenobarbitals, and that's just to say the narcotics. There were like three, four other medications that were non-narcotic. They were just as effective and strong, you know. When, when I wasn't on my medications, I was a walking zombie, you know. But after that, it changed me so much that the people around me that loved me told me I wasn't the same person. Like, my daughter's mom, like, my wife, like, she was like, you're not the man I fell in love with. People were just like, yo, you're not the same. And I, I see it, you know? Like, I know it. I mean, how could I be, you know? Fucking, just fucking wounded in combat, like, four times. I had my head nearly ripped off. <clears throat> the first IED explosion, there was three warheads, 150-pound mortars. Only one went off because the detonation fucked up. The guy in the front seat where I was supposed to be sitting, because I was a sergeant, but let him sit there, had his whole right leg blown off. So, breaking the bones, the ankle, the knee, was lucky compared to him. And he had severe damage in his right hand. You know, the impact, the implosion pushed us in so much that that's what broke the foot, the ankle, and the impact. The, the vest points, broken collar, dislocated shoulder from, you know, holding the rifle. Boom, bang, boom, you know. And I was hearing bells and still tried to get out. When I got out, I just fell down, took my boot off, and my foot went like this. I never experienced such pain, and I blacked out. That's the first time in my life I remember blacking out and getting knocked out, and and it was, I got a purple heart, but get this, I was already, I was in Iraq for three and a half months, and a, like, 75-year-old woman shot me three times in the chest, and because I, because I turned around on her for a second. It was the middle of the night, we were taking her husband, all the computer equipment, everything. My guess is he was an accountant or something like that, because he was old, you know. And we're telling her, oh, no, nah, I'd be fine, don't worry, he'll be back, everything will be back. And we took his phone, her phone, sister's phone, and we're in the kitchen, the interpreter's talking to her, and there's a commotion in the hallway. There's like four guys trying to come down the stairs with AKs. Like, everybody over there has an AK. So they're trying to come down the stairs with AKs because they don't know what the fuck is going on. They got American soldiers in the building. You know, we had soldiers on the roof. You know, we're like, we're tactical with this shit. You know, and it did turn into a firefight. We had, so we shot somebody downstairs, you know, for drawing on us. But, you know, we took our husband. I knew he wasn't coming back. You know, now I'm at the kitchen door and I'm trying to see what's going on in the hallway. I hear the drawer opening. I turn around. And boom, boom, boom. Now they went in and sprayed her, you know, killed her, of course. You know, her sister got shot, you know, by the gunfire, but, you know, she wouldn't know what she was doing. She could have ended my life. Like, I should have never turned around, <laughs> you know. My boy got shot in the shoulder um, by a shoeshine kid. Nine-year-old kid shot him in the shoulder with 45. Yeah, you too, buddy. God bless. Thanks for listening. Sometimes it makes all the difference. And seen. So, I hope that was hearable. Um, I should have warned you that there's a lot of violent imagery and whatnot. I'm sorry if that offended anyone. But I was just so taken with this guy. Um, anyway. I don't know what to do with this, so I just wanted to put it out there. I hope you enjoyed it. All right. Have a good night.